Hi, I'm Dewey Bunnell of the band America. You're watching Rock Cellar TV. Rock Cellar TV. So this is a nice little package uh, recently um, as our career goes heads for its fifth decade we've been doing a lot of unearthing of old stuff you know old uh, demos and projects that never really saw the light of day and this one this one by the way comes with the old logo those of you who are her real minutia people this was the logo of the first album and the second album possibly but so we re revisited that on the packaging. But it's a lot of old uh, demos from England when we first started and then our first year here in, in Los Angeles. That's where we are, Southern California. Um, some stuff that made it onto uh, the first album. Some that has never seen the light of day, like I said. Some uh, Rainbow Song was second album. Ventura Highway is on here. An early take from the record plant. Mitchum Junction. Never made it anywhere. Sea of Destiny, which I like that song. It was one of Jerry's songs, my partner Jerry Beckley. But it's a fun project and it's nice to look back and listen to these things because it just zaps me right back. My memory is much more clear about those first couple of years than it is in the middle decades, you know. <laughs> but uh, it's a nice project. What are some of the memories that were going through your mind when you listened back to this as a, when you finally had it on your <coughs> CD player or in your? Well, this, this, uh, the stuff that was recorded at Chalk Farm Studios in 1970 is the earliest stuff that I can remember at all because, frankly, we had just, um, you know, our band started in 70, straight out of high school. We graduated in 1969 from American High School in London. So Chalk Farm is a, it's kind of a funky little area of London down there. And what I remember is... Um, some of the early reggae music was being made in that studio, demoing, and um, uh, so we were in th this little room. I mean, it was padded. We had rehearsed pretty well, all of, it was just three of us, so we'd had three acoustic guitars and three voices, basically. Uh, Dan and Jerry would uh, trade off on bass guitar sometimes, so it'd be two guitars and a bass. So no real rhythm section. Not many overdubs. So we really relied on playing those songs and having the arrangements as detailed as we could, our, our respective parts on the various guitars and the vocal harmonies, which was what we've always prided ourselves on. We always pursued the vocal harmony um, element of music because it's so magical. And we've been inspired on, in our early youth by bands, you know, like the Everly Brothers we always tout from way back. The fact that the three of us met in high school means we had lives outside. We'd lived in different states and been in different uh, environments, different musical uh, um, influences, so that was pretty cool. But we had a lot of common denominators when we got to know each other. Everly Brothers were always a great, because those songs were great and their harmonies were... So... Um, those were the elements of singer-songwriting that we wanted to really uh, pursue. Songs that could be vocally arranged with lots of nice harmony. Lyrics that may, may or may not be too in inane. <laughs> um, and the acoustic guitars. I mean, for sure we were, those, those last, those years, 67, 8, 9, living in London were pretty uh, heady times for us as American teenagers. In those days, of course, everybody's waiting for the next Beatle record. You waited with bated breath in those days. Pre-internet, pre, really, there was just the local, I, I, I don't want to get off tangent here too much, but uh, reading the New Musical Express and, um, and uh, watching Top of the Pops was about the only musical show until a show by a guy named Bob Harris who, was, who championed us, and he's a great guy. He still is. Um, he had this show called The Old Grey Whistle Test. But you didn't, you didn't have nearly the vast access to any and all kind of music in those days, so you'd wait around the next release by the Beatles or, or someone. And um, 
So we were uh, applying all of that ravenous listening and picking apart of new releases of albums by everybody from the U.S. and England because we lived there. So we got to see a lot of great live music. And I was going to ask you about that. What were, you, you were in England in a very pivotal time period. 67 mm -hmm. to, to 70, yeah. pretty much living there. What were some of the, the magical shows you went to in the clubs, the, the, you know, the legendary Tons. Clubs? I mean, we, I do remember we watched every night for a week, I think it was five nights, at, at the Marquee Club, King Crimson, who were just out. And it was like this <laughs> small club. Those of you who know, the Marquee Club was the legendary, everybody played there. And it was a time, Hendrix, The Stones, it was a tiny club. And, and a lot of bands broke there, or they had their first shows. We actually got to do a couple of sets there in the very beginning. But we'd go there. Um, I, remember, I do remember seeing the Jimi Hendrix experience at the Royal Albert Hall. That's one of my bucket list things. Retrospectively, you know, at the time it was, oh, Hendrix, yay. Now I'm glad I did, obviously. But um, I, I always love stories of people who saw or played with Hendrix. And in our biz, we always run into, yeah, I used to play with... Mike Alsop of Three Dog Night used to jam with Hendrix and Dave Mason, of course, played a lot and we, we cross paths with them and play with them, so it's neat. But um, saw the Rolling Stones a couple of times in England, saw Pink Floyd. We, we opened for Pink Floyd a few times, which is bizarre. I've got these, I, over the years, people will have scanned some posters or old flyers from England, they'll send them. A, there it is in print, you know, we did open for them. They did about three shows with them. And The Who opened for them, and Elton John, people like that. So our British, our British uh, origins are always solid, and that's what, this was the first studio recordings we did once we'd got those, um, that what eventually became the first album, Songs Knocked Into Shape. We were like 17, 18, 19 years old. What were the songs, Dewey, that first attracted record company interest? Were there specific songs where the label said, yeah, that's, that's something that, uh, that's substantial? From that first album and that batch of songs, I Need You was already pinpointed as the single. It was, it, Jerry wrote that song and it's really got a, some kind of, um, you know, mature angle to it that uh, it seemed from a 17 year old kid who wrote it. But it had a lot of mass appeal. It was, it's a really strong ballad. It's been covered by more artists than, our stuff doesn't get covered that much, to be honest, but I Need You did. So that was the focus uh, as far as a, a first release. But we were writing really prolifically at that minute. Every morning or something, Strumps would go, hey, here's something, let's do this. We were living together in a little cowman's house, which was part of a farm up in England in North London. So um, so we had Riverside and Three Roses and Rainy Day. Um, Jerry's uh, Here, the song Here, which is, really has, has uh, been a great part of the live show since. We play about four, three or four songs from the, from the first album on, in our s s live show. Horse With No Name was later well, later, relatively speaking, like a few months later. Did you write that in when England? They wrote that in England. And Ventura Highway wrote in England. Were you nostalgic for home? Yeah, pretty much. I mean, there was a lot of that. Jerry and I always say um, he writes the indoor songs and I write the outdoor songs. <laughs> so like Ventura Highway was my memories of living here in California. Uh, my dad was stationed at Vandenberg Air Force Base. And we were also stationed up in the Bay Area in San Jose. So I had, to, and the, the Vandenberg um, stint was 63, 62, 63. I remember Kennedy being assassinated. But that's when I got the, the full feel, or it became ingrained in me, of the surf and the coast and s surfing and listening to surf music. And that's when I first, it was like seventh grade, and that's when I first picked up a guitar, started picking out little melodies, um, you know, trying to walk, don't run, and pipeline, and instrumental surf music. Ventures. So Ventura, Ventures, Ventures, Dick Dale and the Deltones was my guy. 
we've got to work with Dick Dale since then too. But so Ventura Highway now flash forward uh, a decade almost, well, 1970 from seven years. So now I'm writing songs and uh, that was a theme or an image, some imagery that I wanted to try and capture. Since bef by then, we'd become p totally versed in all the Beach Boys music too. So it was an offshoot of that. The Beach Boys certainly did spearhead the California thing, that specific sun and surf and youth. And I still think it's uh, that catalog is the greatest. Uh, just never ends how wonderful that music is. Well, you spoke about the commonalities that you, Jerry, and Dan had, but what were the, the different qualities that you each brought into the mix as writers and even as yeah. singers, too? Well, always we've always said, again, Jerry was a keyboardist. He was schooled, he, and he was a great guitar player. Jerry's a really great all-around musician, but he brought that st structure. He's, he's always been great at uh, arranging. Basically, he's the musical director. I mean, we pool our resources. We, I'm going back. We, we bring the songs to the table and decide which songs were, were worth pursuing or not. And then it goes into the process of arranging those songs. And you're going to play this. Here's the vocal part you're going to sing. And Jerry was really, really good at that. Dan, too, a uh, great vocal. I was always a little more feral musician. You know, I self-taught, pick out my stuff, live in my own little world and do my thing. Um, without that great uh, bird's eye view of the song and the structure, you know. And I've, I'm really pretty much still that way. I mean, I still, I still need a lot of help in that world of, uh, of when we get into arrangements and things. Just to, I have my definitive idea of how I want the song to go if it, if we're talking about something specific. But so I brought whatever that was. And Dan, Dan had some country influence in him. He was from Missouri originally, really strong, big family from. Farmington, Missouri, outside St. Louis, and so he played some country music. He brought that element a little bit. Don't Cross the River is a pretty good example of that song. And, um, and he played great lead guitar. So that was the three. We, we had a high school band, uh, covers band, and uh, I, th I don't even know if I was in it when Dan was in it. Jerry had this band called The Corporation that morphed into this other band called The Days with a couple of brothers, the Merrill brothers they were. And Dan was in that, and maybe I was in that, but I don't know if we were ever in it together at the same time. I do remember we had to play every Friday night at the uh, teen club, and one Friday, and you had to be there at 7.30 or something, and one Friday night I had gotten tickets through this friend to see Led Zeppelin. So that was like 68, I guess. 69 and so I did <laughs> I just psh, went to see the concert so the next day since I hadn't showed up I was unceremoniously told you're out but we were uh, that was kind of a Mickey Mouse deal we were we were fine after that and Jerry um, I don't know how much you want to get into this but did, after we graduated from high school Dan actually was the only one of us who went back to the U.S. to go to college. He did a month, I mean a month, a semester at uh, Old Dominion in Virginia. And Jerry and I hung around there in London uh, at the base, working at the base, some kind of manual labor jobs. I actually had an inkling to get into drama because I'd liked the school plays and things. and. Um, so I actually did go to a British drama school with a big name, the Corona Academy of Dramatic Arts. And it basically was a schooling place for a lot of young British kids. So Mark Lester was going there from Oliver. And mm -hmm. I remember Susan George became a, a noted actress. And um, Judy Geeson, they, made, they were in some big movies. But it wasn't my thing. It was a lot of... Uh, British dramatic arts, including ballet and fencing, and that wasn't my deal. But and I, the whole time I was playing music at, at at the house, and Jerry was doing the same. Anyway, Dan came back. We got back together. He had some songs he'd written. Jerry and I had a couple of songs. Jerry had done a couple of sessions. 
uh, he'd gotten his foot in the door at a studio and had, had um, played. He can tell you this story better than I because I wasn't privy to that, but he's told it before. That um, he'd written a song too, I think it was Clarice or, you have to ask Jer, but uh, anyway, so there we, f we actually had a toe in the door of a real studio, the music business itself, crack in the door, met some people, this person, that person, played some songs for some people, and before we knew it, we had a guy um, named Dave Housen, Middle Earth Records, it was called. It was a subsidiary, or it was distributed by Chess over here, which I found out that later in life, which was a neat little connection to the famous blues label. But, um, but that didn't last very long. He got us a couple of gigs, and we played, you know, some pubs and things. But the real, the real breakthrough was when we were introduced to a guy named Jeff Dexter, who was a compare MC, kind of an all-around scene maker in London. And he would, he worked um, the big shows like Isla White Festival, he'd be the commentator, ladies and gentlemen, Jimi Hendrix. And, but he, and he worked at uh, the Roundhouse, which was a huge, um, it was the, actually an old train, railway station that was round, I guess they would, they would pivot the drain tracks or something. I don't know how the whole story, but very cool concerts went on there. Um, and it was all patchouli oil and, you know, it was, it was the 60s man. And he got us on the bill there with, um, with Elton John and we did, played a couple of shows there and we saw a couple of shows there. Um, I think that was in Chalk Farm, too. I think the Roundhouse was down there in Chalk Farm. I'd have to double check that, or you could. <laughs> um, now, where did I go from there? Oh, so now we've got Jeff Dexter sort of overseeing us, and we're getting some demoing uh, recording sessions that are paid for by various labels. In those days, we literally walked in to a, a record company's office with our acoustic guitars, sat down and played. Hey, we got these songs. Yeah, very good. And then if they were interested, they would pay for We didn't have any money. I mean, we were, we were ex-Air Force kids, and uh, we were really hand to mouth. And they would um, pay for some studio time. Well, we were playing a couple of companies against each other and didn't really realize that wasn't exactly kosher. It was like we were, you know, uh, because afterwards, when those demo tapes were passed around, these, you know, so this label would say, hey, now we found those guys or we found them. But ultimately, um, Jeff Dexter was pals with, with um, Ian Samwell, Sammy. He was Jeff Dexter's pal. In fact, they lived together in a house. Uh, they were very cool. They kind of squired us around. They, they brought us into, the, into what was happening then and there. Took us to see the dead when they came over in, in 71, I guess it was. Or, and to, anyway, walked us around. And Ian Samwell was a staff producer at Warner Brothers in, down in London. So one of those batch of, of uh, demo tapes were paid for by Warners. And we, we'd actually first walked into the office of Ian Ralphini, who was the president of Warners then. It's actually called Kinney Group. And we played these songs, and apparently they were just knocked out. And, and, and later they said, we, we couldn't hardly contain ourselves. Those songs were great, and you guys had a good thing going. So Ian, Sam, well, we were signed to a five-year, five-year, seven-year deal to Warners, and we went in and, and made the first album with, so it's produced by America, Ian Samwell, or Ian Samuel, Jeff Dexter in America, whatever it was, because we all, right from the beginning, we felt like we were producing, whatever that means, and subsequently did produce um, the next two albums. But I don't know how lengthy you want to go on this. That's, that's pretty much what happened. We, when we went in and mastered, did the, did the master recordings for these songs that are on this, post, uh, Chalk Farm and post demos, for, at least for the first album. Um, we, we pretty well recorded and played them 
verbatim. We just had had these songs down. We were like, set us up, give us a car, guitars, and we could play those things. Boom, boom, boom. And so we didn't do a lot of overdubs. We did some on the first album. We were fortunate to have to be uh, in contact right at that minute with um, Ray Cooper. He was brought in to do some percussion. And David Lindley, who went on to be a friend way back then uh, from Jackson Brown's band and David's solo career. David's a really unique guy. So they were both on the album. And I think Sandman, the song Sandman, we used our old high school drummer too to just come in and in fact, we, we brought, when, when then, when everything broke open, David Atwood, his name was, he was a high school graduate friend of ours who stayed on in London, too. A lot of the families and kids dispersed to the Four Winds and went to, back to the U.S. or wherever they went. And, but David was still hanging around the base working, too. And so when, after the album broke in London and the single Horse With No Name was recorded in a batch of four more songs, the, be the company said, that's the one we want to use. After we'd had I Need You as being the one we're going to release as a single. This all happened really rapidly within a matter of months. Were you surprised that they picked out that horse was, with no name? Was yeah, I, I think so. I mean, I thought it was, it was at best kind of a quirky song. I mean, my mother loved it. My mother and father had uh, retired over there and gone. I was born in Yorkshire, England. My mother was from Yorkshire. So when my dad retired from the military, which he did over there, uh, they got a pub up in Yorkshire. And so we was, I was in close proximity to them. I'd drive up and see them. But um, she loved that song. So that was a good endorsement. Mom likes it. When did you uh, first hear people saying, boy, that, I thought that was in the new Neil Young, Young song? Pretty well right away. I mean, we were, certainly he was in our orbit, in our musical orbit. Um, it was like a great discovery. CSN's first two albums, I guess, were out already. And Neil Young, we were fully aware of. The first Neil Young solo album was just, was just a masterpiece. His, his work is terrific. So those were really right here and in the foreground. I've never denied being heavily influenced by Neil, but, I, but everybody is who they are. You end up doing your own thing, singing vocal harmonies as a trio, it, it's not exactly Crosby, Stills, and Nash, but yeah, if you want it to be. And there was a lot of protecting uh, heroes. I mean, we love those albums and still, still do. They're they're in my top list of, you know, the first two CSNs and Neil's. Everybody, everybody knows this is nowhere and a gold rush. Did love you ever have any encounters with Neil? And did he ever talk about the song? A little bit. We we certainly did. Neil's a bit pretty private guy, as far as I can tell. But, but. Uh, jump forward a year after the record breaks in England and we're doing a tour of the US our first go to the mother country and see if we can break over there because in those days they wouldn't it wasn't uh, just naturally released in the US you, it was released in the UK and it could be licensed or imported but you had to get the mother company uh, or Warner's you know the the uh, offices out here in LA to release it. And they say, well, first you gotta come over and break, you know, do a club tour. We'll do a simultaneous release of the album and single, you guys start playing. And we did a uh, tour with, we did uh, a couple of weeks with the Everly Brothers. Um, we played at the Bitter End in New York, opening for the comedian Robert Klein. Mm -hmm. We did some one-off things, one in Canada, uh, Philadelphia at the main point, and then at the end of the six weeks, we were out in, at the Whiskey. In that course of that six weeks, the record had gone like, boom. We were top ten. It was on everywhere you turned, you know. So now we're out here to jump forward. We barely got back from that tour. Then we, I had met Elliot Roberts at the Warner Brothers offices in London briefly. Knew his name from the album covers. Hey, it's Elliot Roberts. They manage, he and David Geffen manage CSN and Neil Young and Joni. And uh, we'd met briefly and he, he said, yeah, you guys, you got something going and, and uh, we might be interested in representing you or something. I can't remember the exact words. But he did say, we're putting together a band right now called the Eagles. <laughs> Which I 
which now in retrospect is great. The timing was so we did. We barely got back to the UK, got the official call from Geffen. If you want to do it, let's do it. We're like 18, 19, heady times, we fly over, boom. And now we're, st we're in LA. We didn't have a lot to bring with us. We were, you know, we had a suitcase and a guitar or two, and uh, that was it. And we, we stayed up at Kevin's house for, until he said, hey guys, it's about time you guys found <laughs> some apartments or something. And, um, but we met Neil Young briefly then. We met Crosby and Graham, <coughs> Joni, Mitchell, and all of the, all of our heroes. You know, this is the generation kind of ahead. We're these young upstarts, mm -hmm. but we've got a big hit record, you know. And Jackson is in their offices, and J.D. Souther, um, both of who we went out. Now we had to have a live show. I mean, we couldn't just sit there, dee, 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 dee. so we had to put together a a live band, and that's when we did call our buddy, our high school buddy, to play drums. Dave Atwood came out. We got a bass player named David Dickey. David Atwood didn't work out completely after that first tour, um, and we ended up with Willie Leacox, who stayed with us right up until about four years ago. He was our drummer for 40 odd years. He retired finally. But um, we had to get a live show that would fill arenas basically and the big sheds and uh, and Jackson hadn't broken uh, wide open at that point. It's timing I'm trying to remember. Actually, J.D. Souther went out on the first tour opening for us. And you, you know J.D. for his work, his solo work and his his um, collaborations with the Eagles and same likewise with Jackson. So And then Jackson did the second tour. I think we did some stuff with Judy Sill. Like they were representing her too at the time. Um, but uh, that was it pretty much. So the live show I always felt suffered for just lack of experience, you know. We'd never played in big arenas and as much as we could, we were competent. We still didn't have the whole control of the electric set. We did an acoustic set and an electric set in those days and that morphed into one big combo set. But it was always sort of on the job training with the live show. When did you feel, when did you, you guys begin to feel very comfortable in the live setting? It took a little while. It was hit or miss. It was like some nights we were great, you know, and other nights it was like uh, fell apart, the sound, uh, we had vocal problems. I don't know, it just seemed like we'd come off the stage and it was black or white. We'd really kicked ass or it had been really a dud. Um, and of course, you didn't, you, there wasn't a lot of forgiveness when you're playing, we were playing major cities, Chicago, New York, you know, New Orleans. Uh, uh, it wasn't like secondary cities or something. We, we'll go out and work it, work up the set and work new material up out here. And we were starting then to, to play new material on stage too. People didn't really, I think that's always been a, a tough thing for any artist is to play new material when the preponderance of the audience is coming to see what they know. So it's always an uphill battle, unless they're just ravenous and, you're, and everything you do they love, which, which could happen sometimes. Well, America, um, not, not, not long afterwards, enlisted the great Beatle producer, George Martin, yeah. to work with you guys. And that was an extremely prosperous collaboration for mm -hmm. five, five records. What, yeah. what made you want to, obviously, you know, George Martin is an amazing producer, what, but what made you think he would be right for the band? And obviously you were right because of the five records he yeah. produced. He actually did seven, uh, all told, seven? if you include the greatest hits oh, okay. he remixed and, and a live album. Yeah, I was thinking. But five studio, studio albums, yeah. absolutely. Um, well, we had, we had produced uh, the second album then while we were in L.A., which had Ventura Highway, Don't Cross the River. We did that ourselves. We were using uh, portions of the Wrecking Crew, famous uh, studio musicians who played on everything. Uh, look them up. Their history is just incredible. Um, so we had the recordings were going well. We were able to choreograph that through the office with David and Elliot, and, and we produced then the third album, hat trick, um, we got a little more convoluted and a little more adventurous and wrote a, an eight piece 
so uh, an eight minute, eight and a half minute song called Hat Trick, and and it got ponderous. And the the work at, we were at the record plant here in L.A. and we just got kind of bogged down a little bit. We were still excited, and but we were running up the bill and everything. And we knew the next project we need a, a producer, and everybody had a list of producers, but George Martin was always the, the bing, the light bulb guy, and he happened to be in town. Again, Geffen Roberts, their office, were able to find him, track him down, invite him to their offices on the strip over there on, on Sunset to, uh, to meet us and talk about it. And George was open to it, really open, because he was in a bit of flux himself. Beatles had broken up. He was in town for Paul's um, Live and Let Die, the, the James Bond film. So he was just great. We just hit it off. I think the fact that we had this British connection, the fact that we had been successful, it wasn't like he was going to have to break a new band. All we had to do was try and keep this thing on the rails and hopefully write good material. And George would uh, put his t magic touch on it. Yeah, how did he help um, America up its game? Well, we looked up to him, obviously, and he was just like this father figure, wonderful guy, I mean, handsome, talented, had the history. Obviously, the Beatles was, you know, yeah, we love Crosby, Stills, and Nash, and Neil Young, but wow, the Beatles, just got it all here. Um, and he, upping, upping our game, I mean, we were not that objective. I mean, we had an engineer to say that take was good. We had each other to say, uh, you could do that better. We, weren't, we didn't bust each other all that much, but we knew what each of us was capable of. And I think that was a key, and it is a key with any, uh, any collaboration. You have to know each other's strengths and weaknesses and know, he, you know, I'm not gonna be able to play that solo, but I could probably sing the bridge on your song, or you're not gonna be able to do, sing my lyric, but you can, so, <clears throat> so George cut right to the chase on that thing. He would, when we had 15 or 20 songs or whatever we had, he was very good at saying, that one's a bit, well, as we did, as the albums progressed, but he was, that was a bit like that one we did on the last album, and you've already got another song like this on this album anyway, so let's shelve that one. So help out picking the material and see what makes a balance. And, you know, we were making album, <coughs> albums in those days. It wasn't just singles, so. So he was great at that. But he also, with him, we got a, 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 an arranger, a school musician, you know, we got we, or, orchestration. Um, he played some stuff. He was hands-on. Just a great guy, made it a great experience. We recorded in London at um, Air Studios, which was his, uh, his part of the EMI monolith, he, he was working there and not, we didn't go to Abbey Road with George ever. We, we did record at Abbey Road some years later, but not with George. Um, so he brought all that, he just brought it together. It was a feeling of confidence. We had this man, this great legend, taking care of business. All we had to do is go in there, and do the best thing we could, and he'd say, okay, that's good, or, let's try that one again, or, uh, drop in bits and bobs, fix this or that. Let's, he had all the uh, great ideas about where to put a little tasty bit of percussion here or there. And, uh, and he wrote the cello line on Daisy Jane and the, whatever orchestrations we had over the years. He, he was doing that, so it was wonderful. Did you ever get him to open up and share some Beatles stories? You know, we kind of held off on that right away. We thought, this guy's been beat up over the years. I wish I had now, you know, rest in peace. We talked, we had little stories over the years after that. And, uh, but he was pretty good at keeping, preserving, you know, the history and the legend. He wasn't, I've read more stuff uh, about the Beatles things that weren't George quotes. You know, you, you can, there's a lot of people, a lot of flies on the wall back then. And of course we, with George Martin, we got Jeff Emmerich, who engineered all the Beatle records from, I think, what I think I remember him saying his first engineering job was on um, Paperback Rider or something, and he was like a young tape op guy, and so he did all those records, you know. And so 
he's, he's got a book out too, which is, there's some parts in it that might make people squeamish, but as far as tell-alls and all that, but it's a great history. Yeah, you were surrounded by quite the A-game, my God, you had the A-team, I should yeah, say. Yeah, I mean, really. When I look back now, after all these years, you know, David Geffen managing us and George Martin producing us, we should have made a bunch bigger projects. We should have done some, but we were just on our own pace uh, uh, underneath all of that. When Dan left the band um, in the late 70s, how did that change the d dynamic where it was just you and Jerry being the creative engine? How did it change things? Yeah, well, that was really the, uh, bit, that was, we were full bore ahead going up and it was right at, um, it was in 77. Uh, I'm not sure what album is, After Harbor, I guess. A lot of stuff just <coughs> was getting overwhelming. We'd, uh, you know, done lots of tours by then, had a lot of success, a lot of albums. Um, Dan was just veering off a little bit, wanting to do something else. He was, he wasn't as, he, he was a little more restless about things. And ultimately, he was moving into his born again Christian life. It was really, that was a big deciding factor in, in his leaving. And, and it just wasn't clicking, you know, rehearsals were always a little funky. They, we'd go, to, we'd rent SIR rehearsal rooms to work on new stuff or get ready for a tour. And it kind of always just kind of fizzled out, hang out on the couches drinking beer and whatever. So we, uh, so then when, Jer when Dan did depart, yeah, we had this new dynamic. It was Jerry and I, we wanted, first of all, we both agreed we're gonna carry on. And we also agreed we couldn't technically replace Dan with a third full member. We did expand the band a little bit then. We had David Dickey and Willie Leacox on drums. We had Michael Woods, who was our guitar tech, take on the lead guitar role. We didn't even, we didn't even audition other, we could have got some hot name guitar player probably, I don't know. But I've always lived just in camp, I'm in my the America bubble, it was like, before we bring a new guy in, we got someone here, you know, and Michael, who was a great guitar player and had been our, our guitar tech, he, uh, he knew all the tunes, backwards and forwards, rehearsed with him a little bit, okay, that's done, we got them. And then we got um, a, a keyboard slash sax player, Jimmy Cleary, and a, and a percussionist. And uh, it was just, uh, it filled it out, you know. David sang more high harmony parts, um, and we were able to mimic what we'd done before without Dan. We, we did do Dan's, most of Dan's album cut songs were kind of, slid out of the set, but we did, we did, and to this day, obviously we played the hits. Lonely People, Don't Cross the River, we do um, uh, Woman Tonight, and sometimes we do Everyone I Meet is from California, which was one of Dan's songs early on. So his contributions are, are there forever, you know, we were the Three Musketeers. But that was a big, big break. That was when everything changed, and I had moved to the Bay Area by then anyway. I'd been up there in the Bay Area for, with my wife at the time for about three years. Dan and Jerry were in LA, so I was commuting kind of down for work, rehearsals, et cetera, and flying out from there usually. So there were different changes. The little high school band deal was no longer, and we were now a big operation. And we did have to make those shows work. And they did, I think they did. Speaking of big operation, what was the biggest crowd that America ever played to? <laughs> Probably the biggest was the Beach Boys 1984 Washington Monument show, which was about, I don't know, with every those big shows, they always say, it was a million people. But I think they did, they did aerial photography, it was 600,000 or something, 650,000. But we played some big festivals over the years. Um, I was at that show actually. Were you? That was the first because I, I heard Ringo was going to be there. Yeah, to see Ringo. See Beatle was. perform at that point. Yeah. Know, like Paul wasn't even touring then. Yeah. Um, but I was actually at that show. I One of the mystics yeah. is here, Ringo. Yeah, <laughs> I remember that too. Same thing. I'd never met Ringo. Uh, now I, I love Ringo. He's a friend, and I can I can call him a friend. It's terrific. But yeah, Three Dog Night, Beach Boys, 
Ringo, um, Julio Iglesias, was he there? Latoya. Latoya Jackson, wow. Now, the worst was Hank Williams Jr. I remember he played so long that we just were like, oh my God, will you get off the stage? And I think the Four Tops. <laughs> were the Four Tops there too? It might have been the Four Tops or something we, like that was there too. We had to. And uh, I think Justin Hayward and, and uh, John Lodge were there too. <coughs> Moody Blues, yeah. Yeah. Well, we had to leave that day because we had, we were booked, it was the 4th of July, and we were booked to play Casper, Wyoming in the evening. So we went on in the afternoon, sometime midday, in front of, I was, I was playing Carl Wilson's um, Gibson, I think, I remember, he said, you can use this. And we got, so we didn't see the whole rest of the, of the event. We didn't see Ringo that night, I remember, but we had to fly over. I remember, I always remember flying over, uh, you could see fireworks it must have been later in the day then yeah but we got there and touched down and played a show in casper got back it was a private plane that uh, business manager jet it was a it was a lear jet and we and we then we flew home to burbank or somewhere and so we've been to dc casper and home by the way that was i just opened this up and this is the that's up at neil young's ranch neil young and elliot roberts uh had side-by-side -side ranches or something up in Northern California. Broken Arrow, Neil's Ranch. I think this was actually his back here. But this was from the second album shots. Henry Diltz took all the shots. And uh, Henry did all, Henry and Gary Burden, and by the way, we lost Gary a couple days ago. But Gary Burden was, uh, his company was called Artwork. He did the album design and he uh, designed the, our, or not this logo, but the logo we've used from 74 on, from the first George Martin till now, 2018. Gary designed that logo, and uh, Henry took wonderful pictures, of course. He's just a great guy. Only a couple more questions. You've been great. Um, can you pick a Jerry Beckley song that you wish you wrote? <laughs> really? That's a good one. Um... Well, um, he's written so many great songs. I mean, some are just uh, really from those old days. Um, uh, I really want to think about this because he wrote some great acoustic, I mean, songs like To Each His Own and um, yeah, Until the Sun Comes Up Again, those are earlier ones. Uh, there's a new song on, we, we put out an album called Lost and Found two, three years ago. We do. The song on stage called Drive and Jerry wrote, that was great. I'll take the royalties from Sister Golden Hair. <laughs> Me too. <laughs> Me too. Well, final question is, what's the strangest concert bill you guys ever appeared on? Would it be that July 4th? No, well, no, that was a pretty good solid rock and roll. We've been on the stage with like George Burns and uh, uh, we've shared the stage with lots of bands over the years. It's crazy. We do cruise ships nowadays sometimes, these big cruise ships where 22 bands, Greg Allman and another rest in peace, um, Steppenwolf. Uh, uh, some tours when they used to package up, some were more compatible than others, you know, going out with Poco and in those days that was good, but sometimes we'd be on, uh, um, I remember we had Eric Carmen from the Raspberries one year. He was great. He's a talented guy, good showman. I just didn't know if that was compatible. I don't know. I did like all the Bill Graham shows, though, because he, uh, Bill Graham, the, the famous impresario promoter, he'd always mix up. He'd have, you look at the, the list at the Fillmore and, and uh, some of those shows that he did at Winterland and the Bay Area, and he'd have uh, Lenny Bruce and the Mothers of Invention or... Those are great, you know. So I, I kind of like an eclectic mix, but we did, we did a Bob Hope show with John Wayne, Aretha Franklin, uh, Flip Wilson, um, all on the stage at one time, um, doing this Bob Hope himself, doing kind of a soft shoe thing. <laughs> John Wayne, you know, my, my parents were real. You're on stage with John Wayne? Yeah, Mom. But there, there's lots of one-offs that you find yourself. Some of them are just super great surprises. We were put on the bill with the band 
in those early days in Holland one time, which we never, that was just, we were available. They needed someone and we were actually touring in Holland and we were the trio then on the stools. So we got to open for the band. Yeah, we've, done, we've opened for a lot of people over the years. I'll send you a list. That's great. Well, thank you again, Dewey, so much. You're welcome. Nice to be here.